global speed lecture and the first virtual global speed lecture we have ever conducted at the speed. We are so excited to have so many people join us tonight. In fact, we have had more than twice as many people register for this lecture as have ever attended a lecture live at the Speed Museum. I don't know whether that's uh, the speaker tonight or our subject for this year of Egypt, but we're delighted to have you. And I wanna thank my colleagues for helping us make the pivot back in March to really fleshing out what it means to be able to be a museum online. You can find that on our website or in all of our events that we're offering from after hours, um, lectures like this and others that we're offering to you online. Um, I do miss being there in person to be able to greet you. Um, so there's some trade-offs with this, but I also want to thank a few people we would have thanked in person tonight because usually at the Global Speed Lectures, we'd have a cocktail party beforehand for members of our patron circle. And I wanna just remind everybody that our patron circle group is generously sponsored every year by the law firm of Stoll, Keen, and Ogden. Doug Ballantyne, our generous and wonderful trustee, would usually be joining us. So I wanna acknowledge Doug and SKO for their support. Also, if you've been to the Speed since we reopened safely in the beginning of July, you'll see the protocols we put into place. Time ticketing, 100 square feet for every visitor, um, and lots of protection. And I, want to thank and I want to thank Baird and their CEO, Jim Allen, the former Hilliard Lions, for extraordinarily generous support in allowing us to invest in all the things that let us reopen and continue to be open safely. A few quick reminders about things you can come enjoy at the speed in person. Andy Warhol Revelation continues to wow visitors with this blockbuster exhibit. Just had another national review last week um, and it is open through the Sunday after Thanksgiving. The speed of course is now open right now just on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. So please get your ticket in advance and come see Andy Warhol Revelation. I just gave a tour this afternoon to our colleagues from the Louisville um, Orchestra and it was, it's fun to share every time. And finally, Bert Hurley's Loose Nuts or Loose Nuts, Bert Hurley's West End Story is extraordinary exhibit curated by Kim Spence, um, um, reflecting this, showing every page of Bert Hurley's 1933 graphic novella, A Love Story to Louisville's West End is coming to its nearly year end run and will be closing after this weekend. So if you haven't seen it, please come see it in the next few days. And finally, one other thing is if you all were coming in person, we would be charging some of you admission price. Um, it would be free if you were a member. So I hope if you are or have been a member of the Speed Museum, you will renew that membership or consider increasing it. Support we need now more than ever. And if you aren't a member, um, but would have wanted to come to this lecture and are with us tonight, please consider supporting our annual fund. We need every dollar this year to fulfill our mission. At the Speed Museum, we invite everyone to celebrate art forever. And your investment in our mission allows us to have a long relationship with you and to fulfill our commitment to our community during a challenging time. But now I'm gonna get out of the way and just introduce our speaker who I first saw give a lecture very similar to the one he'll give tonight at the Toledo Art Museum a couple of years ago. Bob Breyer visited Louisville a few years ago with his wife as guests of John Hale and visiting academics at the University of Louisville. You may have seen the him and them then, but I'm delighted that they've come back. I'm only sorry that they can't be here with us in person and enjoying a good dinner tonight, but I'm also extremely grateful that Bob is helping kick off our year of Egypt in the Global Speed Lecture. At the end, Abby Shu, our Deputy Director for External Relations and Advancement is gonna share our upcoming Global Speed Lecturers, some other fascinating scholars who are gonna talk about Egypt. But Bob, Mr. Mummy, Bob Breyer is recognized as one of the world's foremost Egyptologists. He's a Senior Research Fellow at the CW Post Campus of Long Island University where he conducts pioneering research in mummification practices and has investigated some of the world's most famous mummies, not just King Tut, but more contemporary mummies like Vladimir Lenin and old Ramses the Great, Eva Peron, Evita, and Marquise Tai, a Chinese noblewoman, and the Medici family of Renaissance Italy. 
In 1994, Dr. Breyer became the first person in over 2,000 years to mummify a human cadaver using the same techniques that he had learned from the ancient Egyptians. This research was the subject of the National Geographic TV special titled Mr. Mummy. And that Bob went on from that to be the host of several award-winning television specials for TLC, Pyramids, Mummies, and Tombs, and Mummy Detective. More recently, National Geographic TV presented his research in a documentary called Secret of the Great Pyramid, discussing a new theory of how the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. His most recent book is Cleopatra's Needles, The Lost Obelisks of Egypt. That only touches of some of Bob's extraordinary work in Egyptology, but tonight he's gonna to share with us why we care about Egypt at all. Why is this fascinating ancient country from North Africa in our minds almost every day? It wasn't always that way. And I so I wish uh, we could all hear your applause, which we can't hear tonight, but I wanna turn this over with gratitude to Dr. Bob Breyer for joining us for the Speed Global Lecture Series. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Stephen. Um, can everybody hear me? I guess they can, I think. Um, I think it's gonna work. Um, what I'd like to do, oh, hi, Nate. What I'd like to do is explain, just like Stephen said, why is it that everybody's so fascinated with Egypt? You know, when, when you go to the museum, if you take a small kid with you, an eight-year-old, say, he doesn't wanna to go to the Greek section. He certainly doesn't wanna to go to the Etruscan section. He wants to go to the Egyptian section. And what is it about Egypt that draws everyone in? So I'll talk about what it is about Egypt, but I'll also talk about some of the historical events that have fanned the flames of Egyptomania. So let me see if I can get my slides up on the screen. I'm gonna hit screen share. I think it's gonna work. Let's see, screen share. Wait, 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 I'm gonna hit share. Ta-da, I think it works. Now, this is a book that you can't get. It's out of print, but I wrote a book years ago about Egyptomania talking about this. Now, let me try to advance my slide just a second. For some reason, my slide is not advancing. Let me see how to do this. Do it sideways. I'm now sharing. Let me try new share, maybe up here. Let's see, I'm gonna try it. Hang on, we're gonna get it. Nope, it's not advancing. Uh, try your mouse. Let me think. Okay, I can do it with a mouse, I think. I think, let's see, wait, went back. There we go. I think it's gonna work. Okay, good. Let me start with a question, a trivia question. What does the Statue of Liberty have to do with Egyptomania? Now I'm gonna put you on chat so that you'll be able to write in your answers. Try it right now, just see if anybody gets it. What does the Statue of Liberty have to do with Egyptomania. Any idea? I'm waiting. I don't see anybody. Ah, it's a tough one. Wait, new message. Hang on, we got one. Let's see. No, not yet. Wait. Hmm, nobody's got it. Maybe it's like a goddess. Nice try, but no. Symbol. Ah, uh, French connection, somebody's got it. Ah, somebody had it, somebody's got it. Okay, several people got it, very good. The answer is, the answer is, it was intended for Egypt. The Statue of Liberty was originally intended to be put at the opening of the Suez Canal, but Egypt went bankrupt and they couldn't afford Bartholdi's statue. So Bartholdi got the idea of rejigging it. Now, let me show you that I'm really telling the truth. Let me try to advance this. That's the design for the original Statue of Liberty. It was an Egyptian peasant woman with a torch and it was called Egypt Enlightening Asia. So when Egypt went bankrupt, Bartholdi got the great idea, let's rejig it a bit, let's call it the Statue of Liberty and I'll sell it to France to give to America as a gift for their centennial. So originally the Statue of Liberty was intended for Egypt. Now, on to the real stuff. Let me go to Let's see, I think I'm okay. I think I can go next. I think we're okay. Mummies are one thing that Egypt has going for it. There's something about mummies that is enticing. If you look at a person like this one and you knew him 2000 years ago, 
you would still recognize him. It's almost as if he has really cheated death. We are looking at a mummy of Ramses the Great. This is probably the only face from the Bible that you will ever see. There is something about mummies, and I think we envy it. If you take a kid to the Egyptian section of a museum and there's a mummy, he will stand there and look at it till his mother drags him away. So mummies are part of this Egyptomania fascination. Now, almost everything that the Egyptians did had to do with eternity. They were really invested in the concept of life after death. So a lot of their art relates to this idea of life after death. So for example, this is a papyrus, a book of the dead. And we have a couple, a deceased, the deceased are there on the left and they're praying. That's why their hands are up like that. That's how the Egyptian prayed. And they're praying to Osiris on the right, the Lord of the dead. He's called the Lord of the West because when Egyptians died, they said they went West. The West was always associated with death. So we've got these papyri, we've got mummies, wonderful things. And that's part of the attraction, but there's more, much more. Now, there were always events that fanned the flames of Egyptomania. And Bonaparte is an Egyptophile. He has a central place in Egyptomania. Now, this is Bonaparte before he's the emperor. He's about 29 years old. He's not the emperor, he's a general, and he's well-educated. He's a culture vulture, and he is going to lead an expedition to Egypt. Now, why does he go to Egypt? Well, there's a political reason. If he can control Egypt, he will cut off England's land route to India and damage their economy. So he's off to India for a political reason, to Egypt for a political reason, but there's something deeper. He has a fascination with the Orient. He wants to be like his hero, Alexander the Great, who went to Egypt and conquered. He even says it. He says, all great men's careers begin in the Orient. So Bonaparte is off to Egypt. The year is 1798. Now this is a painting, a fanciful painting, done of Bonaparte in Egypt. He's on a camel, which never happened. Bonaparte never got on a camel. When he sailed from, from Toulon, he had five horses with him, his own horses. So he's not gonna get on a camel. But anyway, he is fighting the Mamelukes. Now these are fierce warriors who are controlling Egypt. And when he lands, he, he claims, I'm gonna free Egypt, Egyptians from this, this, this oppressive, you know, the oppressors, and he's gonna defeat the Mamelukes. The big battle takes place near the pyramids. It's called the Battle of the Pyramids, but I say it takes place near the pyramids because it wasn't really at the pyramids. It took place in a melon patch in a city called Mbaba, about eight miles from the pyramids. But Bonaparte was very good at PR and he knew that the Battle of the Pyramids sounds much better than the Battle of the Melon Patch. What you can see is Bonaparte's army has formed squares they have their cavalry in the center, they have their artillery at the corner, the cannons, and they have the riflemen on the outside forming the square. Now the Mamelukes are gonna attack on horses and Bonaparte has told his men, do not fire till they're right upon you. Now these guys are undefeated. Bonaparte has never lost a battle with these guys. So they have complete faith in him. So the battle takes place that the Mamelukes are charging, the men are waiting and waiting and waiting and then Bonaparte gives the signal, fire. And they blow the Mamelukes away. Within less than an hour, the battle is over, the Mamelukes retreat, and Bonaparte is in charge of Egypt. His victory will not last long, less than a month. What happens to Bonaparte is on sea. He has anchored his entire fleet at Abu Kir Bay. And Admiral Nelson, sails into Abukir Bay, and this is what's gonna be called the Battle of the Nile, which didn't play, take place on the Nile. The Battle of the Pyramids did not take place on the pyramids. The Battle of the Nile doesn't take place on the Nile, but that's how we know them. So Bonaparte's fleet is anchored off of Abukir Bay. Nelson comes in with his fleet and he does something unheard of. Bonaparte's fleet is very close to the shore, so close that they're pretty sure that nobody can get between them and the shore. So they have all their cannons reconfigured the French. They're, fi they're firing out, out to sea. 
Nelson sails between the ships and the shore. Nobody thought he could do it. And the, and the French can't fire back. The cannons are pointed in the wrong direction. The fleet is destroyed. It's a battle that starts in the afternoon, late afternoon, goes through the night. And this is an accurate painting of what happened. The ship on the left is the largest ship in the world at the time, the French flagship, the Lorient, and it's burning. In the bottom, in the hold of the ship, all the powder, all the gunpowder was stored. And when that thing catches fire, it blows up with the loudest man-made noise ever heard on earth. It could be heard, heard 10 miles away. We had to learn a poem in uh, school when I was a kid called The Boy Stood on the Burning Deck. That is about Captain Casabianca's son who won't desert the ship until he finds his father and they all die. So now Bonaparte's fleet is sunk. Nelson says, Bonaparte is in a jam and he's not going to get out of it. Bonaparte can't get any reinforcements. He can't get supplies. He's in trouble. Nelson just sails away, leaving Bonaparte stranded. What does Bonaparte do? He founds an institute for studying Egypt. He's undaunted. He has brought with him 155 artists, architects, engineers to describe Egypt. I mean, it's an amazing thing to do. He's going off to war in a country he's never been in, and he's taking architects, engineers, artists to describe the whole thing. It's like a, a great ethnographic survey. And here's an artist doing a study of Pompey's pillar. And these guys, while they're stranded under very difficult conditions, are indeed describing Egypt. And we get pictures of them. This is a painting by Maurice Orange of Bonaparte examining a mummy, right? at the Giza Plateau, I think you can see just to the right of Bonaparte is one of the savants, one of the scientists. He's got an umbrella. He's holding an umbrella and he's got his sketchbook under his arm and he's wearing an impossibly warm suit for the summer, but that's the way they were dressed. So he's got his savants and they are gonna describe Egypt. This is an engraving from what the savants did. When they returned from Egypt, finally, they published the largest publication in the history of the world then, the Description de l'Egypte. This is one engraving out of 750. It's a massive 22 volume set. And this is the first careful, accurate representations of the, of the monuments of Egypt. This is how Egypt learns about, this is how Europe learns about Egypt. Now, there's a rumor or a myth that Bonaparte shot off the nose of the Sphinx. It's not true, it's not true. Bonaparte respected the monuments and he would never do that. We have some drawings of the Sphinx done by two ship captains from the 1770s and indeed the nose was gone then. So the Sphinx had lost its nose long ago. But these engravings are the first accurate drawings of the monuments. This mummy was brought back by Bonaparte and given to Josephine as a present. It was in her estate when it was auctioned off, right? So this is how Europe learns. Now, Bonaparte loses, of course. He, he, he deserts his men eventually, um, goes back to France, tells them he won, doesn't matter. Um, he doesn't care. Anyway, but there's a lot of Egyptomania sort of spin-offs from this expedition. The English, who actually did defeat Bonaparte, they produced this tea set. Now, Wedgwood is not you know, famous for tea sets like this, but it's called Nileware. And the idea is that when you had your tea in a service that had a crocodile handle, it has a winged solar disc, it has all these Egyptian motifs on it. When you had your tea in the morning, you were really being patriotic and saying, we beat Bonaparte, we beat Bonaparte. So England is producing these Egyptomania bits, but Bonaparte does it too, because he's claiming victory. And he had Sever, the famous porcelain service, produce a service for 34 for Josephine. All of these plates are hand painted. Every one had a different scene on it. And this is Bonaparte leading the men. Bonaparte finished this set, I think it was about 1815, something like that. And Josephine is getting a divorce, right? She's getting a divorce and she says, I don't really like the service. I'd rather have the money, please. And he gives her the money and he keeps the service. So this is the Egyptian tea service that Bonaparte has. Now, one other thing that Egypt has going is not just mummies, it's not just pyramids, it's obelisks. 
Obelisks are purely Egyptian. They're a single shaft of stone. And the word obelisk is actually Greek. It means meat skewer, like in shish kebab, because when the Greeks came in and they saw these long, tall, pointy things, they said, ah, it's like our meat skewers. So they called them obeliscus, which is a meat skewer. But obelisks are also purely Egyptian. Now, after Bonaparte died, Egypt was ruled by Muhammad Ali, a cruel, ruthless leader, but he wanted to curry favor with European powers. So he started giving away obelisks to various countries that he thought would be helpful to him. First was France. France is the first country to take an obelisk in modern times in the 19th century, 1833. Now, obelisks always came in pairs. This is Luxor Temple in the 1870s. And this is their pair of obelisks in the front of the temple. And obelisks don't have interesting inscriptions on them. They're covered with hieroglyphs, but they're not particularly interesting. They just contain the names of the pharaohs and his titles. It's basically saying, I built this temple. So we have the two obelisks here, but the obelisk on the right is the one that's now in Paris. It's going to be taken by Apollonaire Lebas. And let me show you the drawing of him taking the obelisk down. There it is. He's encapsulated it in wood and they're lowering it, and it'll take more than two years to get it to Paris and erect it. But on October 25th, 1835, we get it here, and this is a painting of the obelisk being erected in the Place de la Concorde. Now, this is going to cause obelisk envy in the part of the Brits. They want an obelisk. The Americans are gonna want an obelisk. So everybody's gonna be competing for obelisks. Now, there are still two obelisks at Alexandria, right on the sea, and one is erect, and the other one had fallen in an earthquake, and England was given this one in 1876. And here they are, they're measuring it, the fallen obelisk, they're gonna take the fallen obelisk, and they're gonna bring it back to England. They have a problem. The obelisk was placed in a caisson. That's what you're looking at now. It's that long tube that's on its side. It's an iron tube. They put the obelisk inside it and actually living in the caisson with the obelisk is a crew of three or four and it's capsized in a hurricane as it's being towed back to England. Great problem is how to get the men off this caisson. It's in the middle of a hurricane being towed by a steamship there and five brave men volunteer to be lowered in a hurricane off the steamship, row themselves to the caisson and try to get the crew off of this little, this, this capsized caisson. So they're lowered, they're getting very close to the obelisk and just then a huge wave comes, crashes down on the rowboat and they're never seen again. Five brave men lost their lives. But finally, the men are gotten off the caisson and the obelisk is taken to England. Now, this is the obelisk, this is the London obelisk and it's shown in front of the Houses of Parliament. Now, it's not there. This is an illustration from the Illustrated London News. And what's going on? I mean, how can they show an obelisk where it isn't? Well, when the obelisk finally arrived in London, they still hadn't decided where they were gonna put it. So what they did was they made a wooden life-size replica of the obelisk, and they dragged it through the streets of London, erecting it in different places and saying, what do you think? How about here? No, a little to the left, a little to the right. So they're moving it around, but eventually they finally decide it should go by the water, by the Thames, which is where it is today on the Thames Embankment. And you can visit it when you, when you go to London. So with these obelisks coming, now this is the era of newspapers. So everybody can follow the, the comings and goings of the obelisk. And it sets off a wave of Egyptomania, just like Bonaparte being in Egypt sets off a wave of Egyptomania, obelisks set off a wave of Egyptomania. So we start to get all kinds of products, souvenirs related to obelisks. You can see the obelisk spoon. There's a very small obelisk pen knife, but the other silver objects, they're mechanical pencils. Ladies would wear these around their necks. You can see the little ring where you could wear it around your neck. And when you wanted to write, you pulled that long, that little silver, silver ring and the, and the lead came out the other end of the obelisk off the tip. So ladies could write with obelisks. This is a decanter, an obelisk decanter. 
which was used to hold absinthe in a bar in London, right? So you have obelisk decanters. Now, obelisks are long and thin. What can you do with them? Well, you can make souvenir thermometers. So you get all kinds of thermometers that are tacked onto bronze obelisks. And they're, everybody's trying to cash in on Egyptomania. Well, you even get sheet music. And here's a song, Cleopatra's Needle Waltz. Right? And there's Cleopatra, not very pretty. You also get a lot of cigarette products associated with Egypt at this time because tobaccos were grown in Turkey where they were Turkish tobaccos, but they wanted to associate with Egypt. And this is one called Cleopatra. It's a, as you can see on the bottom, it's a Hungarian cigarette actually, um, but it's called Cleopatra Egyptian cigarettes. And there's Cleopatra holding the asp and she looks rather bored. It's kind of a strange tin, but it would sell. Here's another one, Oriental cigarettes sold by Sullivan and Powell. Um, not exactly an Egyptian name, but it works. This is my favorite. You can see the Egyptian motif on the top, the winged solar disc. You have two cobras on either side. You got the wings there. And on the extreme right and left, you see the pillars. The problem is they got almost everything else wrong. Mogul is Indian. And if you look at the guys who are cavorting on the, on the boardwalk where it says, just like being in Cairo on the Mogul, those guys are Assyrians, but it didn't matter. Nobody really knew. Also associated with tobacco were humidors. And this is a humidor for pipe tobacco, which is in the shape of a canopic jar, the jars in which they put the internal organs after mummification. So everybody's cashing in. You get wonderful jewelry after the obelisks start coming over. Pins, some of them actually look like American bald eagle, but they're really supposed to be the vulture, the Egyptian vulture. And this is of course a winged scarab pin, very Egyptian. It has the two cobras on either side. Um, and this is something that a fashionable lady would wear as a brooch. One of my favorites is somebody who made, some jeweler made one of these pins, but instead of having a scarab in the middle, he's got a trilobite. And he's got the solar disc being held by the, by the legs, but it's a, it's a trilobite. Anyway, everybody is into obelisk. So America had obelisk envy and they had to get an obelisk. So they were given the obelisk at Alexandria, the upright one. Now, technically this obelisk was not given to the United States. It was given to New York City. And the reason for that is the man who was paying for the transportation was William Vanderbilt, a New Yorker and he wanted to make sure it went to New York City, so it was given to New York City. Here, it's still upright. It's clad in wood to protect it. You got the obligatory flag flying from it, and it's going to be pivoted. It's going to be turned on a pivot. Let me show it to you. Take a look at it. Look closely. I think you'll see in the middle of the obelisk is what's called a trunnion. It's a little triangle thing, and it's clamped onto the obelisk. And using cables, the obelisk is pivoted off its base and brought horizontal. Now, the man who was moving it, Gorringe, was, was a really, really wonderful guy, very good engineer. And he was afraid that if a cable broke while they were pivoting it to the horizontal, it might fall and crash to the ground. So he stacked up all those crates on the left that you can see, all those wood timbers. And indeed, a cable broke and the crates saved it. It crashed, this obelisk crashed into those crates and there it is saved. And now the men are repositioning the American flag. That gives you an idea of the scale of the obelisk. You know, it weighs about 250 tons. It's a big piece of stone. And the way he was gonna transport it, he bought a decommissioned postal steamer in Egypt. And he opened the hull, pushed the obelisk in on cannonballs, closed the hull, and sailed off to New York with his obelisk. There it is crossing the Hudson River, right? And fortunately, Vanderbilt owned the trains, so he could stop the train, and the obelisk comes through here across the, the train tracks. And there it is moving into Central Park in the dead of winter. They had to build this trestle to keep it level. There's a little steam engine on the left, you can see it, and it's winching, the, they're winching the obelisk along at the rate of about one city block per day. And there it is being erected in Central Park. That trunnion, by the way, was built by Roebling, the Roebling Ironworks in New Jersey. And Roebling had just completed 
the Brooklyn Bridge. So they had a lot of experience doing things like this. So New York gets its obelisk and there it is in Central Park today. Now with the New York obelisk, you start to get all kinds of products also. Now, since it's called Cleopatra's Needle, Cleopatra's Needle, it's natural that thread goods stores, milliners, would give out little souvenirs associating their products, the, the threads and needles with Cleopatra. So here's Cleopatra and she's threading a needle, but you can see it's really an obelisk. She wears on her head, what we all call in Egyptology, the dead chicken headdress. It's really a vulture, right? Representing a protective deity. But we always sort of call it the dead, dead chicken headdress. Here's another one where the obelisk is being brought on threads of spool, spools of thread. And the winch that they're winching it along with is also spooled thread. And there's one more, which is kind of fun, from an Italian company. And you get all these little pooty, the, the, the angels, pulling the obelisk up with thread. So these are some more spin-offs of obelisk mania. Now, at around the same time, 1880s, 1881, we get our obelisk, cemeteries are starting to have obelisks placed above, the, above tombs because Egypt was always associated with immortality. So we start to get these obelisks. Um, this is um, Woodlawn Cemetery, which is within walking distance of my place in the Bronx. And not only obelisks, you're gonna get all kinds of things. So for example, the Woolworth Mausoleum is a real bit of Egyptomania. You can see all the, 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 the trappings of Egyptomania. You've got the columns, you've got the winged solar disc above the Woolworth name, and you've got the sphinxes. Now, I've never quite seen a sphinx like that in Egypt, but I guess Mr. Woolworth wants to be happy for eternity. Um, this is in, on the island of Philae. It's Trajan's kiosk, right? Lovely kiosk. And at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, you got a replica of it for a mausoleum right there. My favorite one is this crazy one, which is supposed to be a pyramid, but it looks more like a hobbit house. But anyway, people wanted to associate their mausolea with ancient Egypt. We also get Egyptian, you know, Orientalist paintings, which is another sort of perk of Egyptomania. And this is feeding the sacred ibis, right? Another one in the harem and a procession of the sacred bull, the apis bull. So all of these paintings are other examples of maybe upper class Egyptomania, but it's still Egyptomania. And of course, maybe the event that sets off the biggest wave of Egyptomania is the discovery of King Tut's tomb. Now, this is of course the gold mask of Tutankhamun. I think, I think it's probably the most famous artifact from the ancient world. I can't think of anything else that is more recognizable from the ancient world than Tut's golden mask. And of course we have Carter discovering the tomb in, 18, in 1922. And here he is looking at the mummy in this gold coffin. Everybody followed the excavation. They wanted to see the pieces as they were brought out of the tomb. You had the fabulous jewels. Everybody's going crazy. They loved it. But also people are cashing in. For example, there was a magician named Carter. That was his real name doesn't just take it from Howard Carter, his real name, he was a magician before the discovery, but after the discovery, his show becomes very Egyptianized. And here you have it, Carter the Great sweeps the secrets of the Sphinx and marvels of the tomb of old King Tut to the modern world. This sheet music. Now this one is really interesting, old King Tut. Now, of course, we know that Tutankhamun was only about 18 years old when he died. But when this sheet music was rushed into print, nobody knew that. So everybody thought he's probably gonna be an old guy. So they showed Tut as old King Tut with a cigar, but nobody knew. Cleopatra had a jazz band is another one. But even before Tutankhamun's discovery, just before sheet music had lots of Egyptian themes. I like this one, Mummy Mine. You can see she's a flapper and she's got her dead chicken headdress on. And the lyrics are, are great. Mummy, a million years you've been sleeping. Mummy, a million years I've used in weeping. I've waited through the years just sighing. Oh, can't you hear me again crying? Waken. Your love no more denying, mummy mine, mine. And of course they've got it wrong. It's not a million years, it's a couple of thousand years, but nobody knows. Another one at the mummy's ball. See, at this point, mummies aren't these fearsome objects. You know, they're, they're friendly. Mummies are your friend. Cleopatra made them stare, vamped each old mummy there. 
I do declare old King Ramsay shook himself to pieces, dancing at the mummy's ball. And this one's another great piece of sheet music, just so iconically beautiful, Americans on the Nile. And the idea is this is when you could go to Egypt on a steamer, a cook steamer, you could, you could, you could tour, the, tour Egypt. So this is something that everybody wanted to do. Not everybody could afford it, but you had the sheet music. Now, this is a strange one. It has many, many of the images of Egypt. For example, we have the falcons, Horus, on either side. And Horus holds the crook and flail, symbols of authority. It holds the scepter, the was scepter of power. And it's flanking the sphinx. That's all very good. Except the name is Aphrodite Waltz, and she's Greek. But people just didn't know. They weren't sophisticated. It would work. And this one I don't get at all. The Irish were Egyptians long ago. Very strange, very strange. Now you get the movies also. The first big Cleopatra film was Claudette Colbert as Cleopatra. But then you get Karloff in The Mummy. And this is something that I think you should all watch on Halloween on Saturday. It's a mummy movie where the mummy has a girlfriend. It's a wonderful movie based on Tutankhamun discovery. You'll see the artifacts that they have there are replicas of Tutankhamun's, from Tutankhamun's tomb. But this is a mummy you can sort of root for for a while. He's, he's separated from his girlfriend. She wants to be with him. It's, it's a very unusual mummy movie. And it's really, I think, the best of all of them. You also start to get novels. The Scarab Murder Case is a, is a murder mystery by S.S. Van Dyne, a well-known novelist of the 20s. And it was written in conjunction with the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Egyptian department. They participated in, in the writing of it. So it's pretty good. It's, you, I think you'll enjoy it. And then you get plays on Broadway. And you can see this young lady is wearing a kind of hokey takeoff on the dead chicken headdress. But it worked. It would work in the theater. You get products like Cleopatra Rose talcum powder, perfumes with a sphinx on the bottle, and the longest running ad campaign associated with Egypt was palm olive soap. Palm olive is made up of two oils from the palm tree and the olive tree. So it really does have an oriental connection and Cleopatra is associated with beauty. So you get this connection of beauty and the orient and palm olive creates their soap. Now their only problem is soaps were always white and because of the olive oil, their soap was green. So they turned it into a virtue and made it exotic. It's an Egyptian project, product. And they had these wonderful, wonderful illustrations. Let me show you one more, just fabulous. And it continues today, by the way. If you buy this soap in Greece today, it's under the brand name of Cleopatra. Now, we've seen a lot of events that cause Egyptomania, but I want to make a prediction. I want to tell you about the next wave. It's going to be Tutankhamun again, and it's going to be in, 19, in, in 2022, which is the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb. And everybody is going to go nuts again with Tutankhamun and Egyptomania. You're going to have exhibitions. You're going to have the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo opening up again. So be prepared for the next wave of Tutankhamun. Now, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. So I'm going to think I have to go to stop share screen there. And I think everybody can write in their questions. Let's try it. Do we have any questions? You can use a question answer feature to submit, it says. I'm going to hit, well, I got one question and answer. I'm going to hit, I wonder if I can hit question and answer. Let me see. I'm going to try. Oh, wait, yeah, let me see. Did the question pop up on this right? The question didn't pop up yet. It says, Bob, you have one question. Let me try it. Yep, here it is. Uh, Joseph says, your thoughts on how the ancient Egyptians were able to maintain a stable culture for so many decades with minimal change in culture and religion? Ah, good question, good question. Um, let me try to answer it. It's a very good question. You know, Egypt lasted for 3,000 years, I mean, which, which is really remarkable. Um, and I think part of it is centralized government. They had a pharaoh, one guy, 
You know, it wasn't voting, nobody's voting, nobody's changing. But also Egypt was very successful. It was dominating the Middle East. So if it's not broke, don't change it. Another thing is they were the most conservative nation in the world. Even their art, they didn't want the art to change. Over 3000 years, the art barely changed. It was almost paint by numbers. If you wanted to do a painting, you put a grid down and the artist simply copied in the grid. It was almost like paint by numbers. And for example, we don't even have a word for artist. There's no word for artist, right? They were simply craftspeople. So they didn't want to change it at all. And it pretty much didn't change. Ah, got another question from Richard. Was there another wave of Egyptomania in the 1970s with the Tut exhibit? Ah, yes, indeed. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, there was another, another, another wave in the 70s. You know, that's where you get Steve Martin's famous song, you know, King Tut, born in Arizona, built a condo made of stone or King Tut. He's actually singing, not about King Tut, but about the exhibition, right? Because you remember there's a line in it, if I'd have known, I'd have bought me a museum, right? The idea is that everybody was making money off of it. So yeah, the Tut exhibit is another really, really big one. Uh, Soraya, I have another one here. Where can I find the inscription Amos wrote to his mother, Ahotep, where he calls her the protector of Egypt? I know it's a little unrelated. Um, get a book by Miriam Licktime called um, Ancient Egyptian Literature. It's in there. Uh, let's go, Talden. Um, in Egyptian art, we can see images of embalmed bodies, but never see skeletons or decomposing bodies. Why is that? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, actually, in Egyptian art, you see the wrapped bodies, but you don't see what's inside the wrappings. So while there really were sometimes skeletons or decomposition, you're not gonna see it. But also, you know, if, if a body became skeletonized, if it decomposed, that was sort of a loss. It, was, it wasn't a good thing. So the Egyptians never, never recorded losses. So there are several reasons why you never see that. Uh, Lana, let me see what you got here. Why is there so much confusion between who King Tut's mother is I've always thought it was Kia, but then you hear it's Nefertiti. No, we're almost sure that it's Kia, but I think because Nefertiti is the famous wife of Akhenaten, the father, that everybody thinks, oh, it must have been Nefertiti. But no, it's pretty sure it's Kia. Almost everybody agrees. Um, ah, interesting question. <laughs> Anonymous, coward. Um, do you still believe Tut was murdered? If not, why? I think he was. Um, I wrote a book on uh, the murder of Tutankhamun about 20 years ago, it, which was just a theory, presenting a theory that Tut was actually murdered. It's based on a lot of circumstantial evidence that his, his widow wrote this strange letter to the Hittite king saying, I'm afraid, you know, I don't want to marry somebody else. Um, anyway, um, I still believe it. I think it's still probably the best guess at what happens to Tut. But there's a little bit of evidence against it now, some new evidence in the last 20 years. And what it is, is that there's been a very good CAT scan of Tutankhamun lately, just, just in the last couple of years. And it shows that there isn't really this big blow to the back of the head that everybody talked about. So we'll see, but it's still a good theory, I think. Matt McKissick, my goodness, here it is. What, did, what does he say? Will you please share your defining moments or experiences after which you knew your Egyptology would be in your future? Oh my God, Matt, that's a strange question. How did I become an Egyptologist? Um, the answer is, I didn't ever intend to become an Egyptologist. It was an accident. Um, I had a PhD in philosophy. I was chairman of the philosophy department. I had gone to medical school. Um, I had done other things, um, but I was playing basketball. That's what I really liked to do. I injured my legs. I had to have operations on my knees, the old ACL operations. And somebody gave me a copy of Gardner's Egyptian grammar textbook to while away the hours while I was recovering. And for eight hours a day, I did nothing but hieroglyphs. I, got, I became fascinated with hieroglyphs. So after the cast came off my legs, you know, it took months and months and months in those days, no arthroscopic surgery, um, I could translate hieroglyphs. And then people began asking me to translate texts for them, um, museums, things like that. And my university asked me, could I teach a course in Egyptology and hieroglyphs? So I taught a hieroglyph course. And then my students said, Dr. Pryor, Dr. Pryor, we've got to go to Egypt. So I organized a student tour. We went to Egypt and then I said, this is better than philosophy. So I became an Egyptologist. That's how I did it. Next question, we got Kimberly. Um, Egypt has had many influences on the world around it. If you had to choose, what would you say was the single most influential aspect of Egypt's life that has influenced the rest of the world? How interesting. 
I think it's partly this notion, I think the notion of immortality. They are so into immortality that I think it spread out to other cultures and the idea of life after death comes from them. But remember, the Egyptians believe in resurrection. They believe that the body would get up and go again in the next world. And we certainly have that in Christianity. So it's possible. Uh, Karen Tate is going to answer this question live. Let's see. Karen, do you have something to say? I'm just looking. Nope, you are good to keep going. Oh, okay, Karen. So I saw a little note that said, um, let's see. Have there been challenges to taking the obelisk out of Egypt? Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a patrimony, patrimony question that Linda's asking. Um, there have. Recently, Zahi Awas wants to get them back. The problem with that is they're legal. They were actually given by Egypt to the various countries. So they're perfectly legal. And I don't think they're going back. But I will tell you something. I'm not a big one on repatriation. I, I'm happy to have Egyptian objects in museums around the world. That, that doesn't bother me. The one object I would like to go back is an obelisk. It is. It's the obelisk in Paris. Because I think it would be fabulous if Luxor Temple had both its obelisks rather than just one now. It would just be incredible. So I'd love to see that go back. It's not going to happen. But no, I don't. it doesn't bother me. But there have been cha challenges. Uh, Ralph, which Egyptian god is your personal favorite and why? How interesting. Hmm, I don't know which one is my favorite. Oh, you know, I'm a mummy person. I like mummification. I did mummification. I guess I'll have to say Anubis, who is the god of mummification. That's my boy, Anubis. Richard, uh, what can you tell us about the recent discovery of a cache of mummies, which has just been in the paper last week? Where was this and do they know who these mummies might be? Uh, yes, I think a lot of you have seen the press on it. Um, the mummies were discovered at Saqqara. Saqqara is the largest cemetery in ancient Egypt, covers acres and acres, and were used for 2,000 years for burials. So if you dig almost any place, you will find mummies. So these mummies that were found are nothing really super special. They're middle-class mummies. Um, there's lots of them. They're undisturbed, which is good. But as of now, we don't really know who these mummies are, but they'll be published eventually. It'll take a year or two. They'll translate the hieroglyphs. But it's, it's a nice find, but it's not earth shaking. Right? Uh, Victoria, whatever came of the hypothesis that there are other rooms in Tut's tomb? Ah, very good question. Um, these are good questions. Um, the theory is that behind one of the walls in Tutankhamun's tomb is the tomb of Nefertiti. This was put forth by a good friend of mine, Nick Reeves, who is probably the world's foremost authority on Tutankhamun. He was looking at scans. It comes about maybe 10 years ago almost now, scans of the wall of Tutankhamun's tomb, very careful laser scans. And he saw what looked like straight lines that could be a doorway underneath the painting. And Nick presented the idea that maybe Nefertiti is behind Tutankhamun's, you know, stepmother, I guess it would be, is, is behind. And Nick thought it really was a good idea, you know, that, that, that Nefertiti could be behind there. The problem is there have been later scans that seem to suggest there's nothing behind the wall. Nick is still hanging on to the theory. He thinks it's possible, but later evidence suggests mm, maybe not. That's why you don't hear much about it. Um, Ildiko, let's see what we got. I read that Tut's gold mask was never originally meant for him, but for a woman or a queen. What are your thoughts on that? That's another Nick Reeves theory, and it's more than a theory. If you look at the back of the mask, on the inside, you can see the cartouche where it says Tutankhamun has been altered, meaning it's, it was something before Tutankhamun, and Nick thinks it might have been for a woman, but we're not 100% sure. But definitely, the gold mask has been altered. Uh, let's see. My seven-year-old wants to know, this is Denisha, uh, how big was ancient Egypt? Ancient Egypt is pretty big. It's about 500 miles long, it's, um, but it's mostly desert. That's the problem. Egypt is, in a sense, a small country. Everybody in ancient Egypt lived along the river. So very little of Egypt, very little of Egypt was used as land where people lived. They all lived along the Nile, and it had a population of about maybe 2 million at its largest. Another question, uh, Heather, if you could go back in time, who would you like to meet? No question about it, Akhenaten. 
the heretic Pharaoh, the Pharaoh who changed the religion from polytheism, many gods, to monotheism, one God. Akhenaten is the first one in recorded history to say there is only one God. And it's a turning point for the world. Um, we don't know the details of what was in his mind, what happened, but that's the one I want to meet, Akhenaten. Lisa and Sean, my goodness, um, we've watched so many of your videos, we're curious, how many languages can you speak? Um, well, if you talk to my teachers, they'll tell you I don't even speak English well. Um, I guess I can speak about maybe mm, four or five, four or five, but none of them really well. You know, you work in Egypt, you learn to speak Arabic, or that kind of thing, but not, not, nothing really great. Um, Janet, can you talk about Queen Hatshepsut? Why isn't she as well known as Cleopatra? Ah, she should, she should be as well known as Cleopatra. You know, Hatshepsut was a woman who ruled Egypt as a king. I think part of the reason, part of the reason we don't hear much about Hatshepsut is her name was erased from history. So for thousands of years, people didn't even know that Hatshepsut existed, whereas Cleopatra's name was never lost. Remember, Cleopatra was a Greek. She was a Ptolemy. So the Greeks carry on the tradition of Cleopatra. So maybe that's why Hatshepsut isn't as well known. Uh, let's see. Ah, Denisha. Ah, I got another nine-year-old question here. My, my nine-year-old wants to know, how do you do mummification? Uh, well, tell them not to try it at home first. You don't do it at home. Um, but what you have to do is dehydrate the body. You have to dry out the body. That's the key to mummification. So for example, if you can remove the internal organs, which are moist and dry them out, if you can take out the brain through the nose and then dry out the whole body, it'll be preserved forever. So that's why when I showed you that slide, that image of Ramses the Great, that's why he's preserved. There's no moisture in him and bacteria need moisture to decay things. So if you dry it out, the body will last forever. So that's why, you know, when you have your dried cereal and in the box there's blueberries, you know, the reason you have blueberries is because they're dried. They're not going to rot. So you have really inside a little mummy of a blueberry. Think about that when you eat your cereal. Uh, next question, Karen, when did you last go to Egypt? Ah, I haven't been in almost a year. You know, um, I go every year, maybe a couple times a year. I sometimes guide groups even through Egypt. And I canceled all my trips because of the virus for 2021. And I'm not sure when I'm going to get to go back. It might be another year even. Uh, so I was there a little less than a year ago, I guess. Ah, next question for Susan. Have you been inside of any of the pyramids? If so, what did you find most fascinating? Uh, sure, you know, even tourists can go inside the pyramids and I've been in, in, into most of them. I think still the Great Pyramid is the best one to go into. And what really is amazing is the internal construction. There's one room in, in, in the Great Pyramid called the Grand Gallery. And it's this thin room, it's maybe only, oh, 20 feet wide, but it's, you know, 30 feet high and it's got these fabulous walls and you just wonder what was it used for? Why they build it that way? So the Great Pyramid inside is the most complex of all the pyramids. Uh, Kimberly, you theorized that the scaffolding for the construction on the pyramids was built directly onto the walls. Is there any new evidence to support that? Ah, um, yeah, the idea is that the, that the um, not so much the scaffolding, I think. Oh, I, I know what you mean. I'm sorry, I didn't think, think about it. The scaffolding, I think you mean when, when they're building the pyramid, that what did they do? Um, how did they get the blocks up to the top? There was one theory that it's built right on the pyramid like a corkscrew uh, road up a mountain. Um, there's no new theory or evidence lately, nothing, nothing new, sorry. Did mummification drop out of practice? If so, when and why? Well, of course mummification dropped out of practice, but the interesting answer is when. The Egyptians, as you know, were conquered by the Greeks and then they were conquered by the Romans. But in a sense, it's the Egyptians who conquered the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks and Romans wanted to practice mummification. They liked the idea of immortality. They wanted to be immortal just the same way that it looked like Egyptians were immortal. So the Greeks and the Romans, they practiced mummification too. It's only when you get the Christians, the Christians are <coughs> the one who say it's wrong to mummify. So the Christians stop mummifying. Another question, let's see. Uh, Lana, Lana, do we have any more information about Queen Ankhesenamun than that we know, already know? Ah, you know, in my book, The Murder of Tutankhamun, I talk about Queen Ankhesenamun, who was Tutankhamun's wife, 
and she disappears from history. After Tut dies, she writes this letter saying, I'm afraid, never will I marry a commoner. You know, she wants to marry a foreign prince and make him king of Egypt. It's all strange stuff, but then she disappears. Her body has never been found. Her tomb has never been found. No artifacts from her tomb have never been found. We simply don't know what's happened to her. Maybe someday we'll find a tomb. I doubt it. I don't think she ended well. An anonymous attendee, do you have any favorite historical fiction books set in ancient Egypt or about Egypt? Mm. Yeah, I have a few I can suggest. One is that scarab murder mystery I mentioned, but also I think one of the best ever written, one of the best, is called The Egyptian by Mika Walteri, W-A-L-T-A-R-I. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. And it's, it's sometimes, you know, it was used for a movie called The Egyptian, right? And it's the story of Sinui based on Egyptian papyrus. It's quite good. The other thing that I think everybody likes is Barbara Mertz's books. She wrote a whole series of books, the, the Amelia Peabody books, and Barbara Mertz is her name, you know, and she wrote, she was an Egyptologist, and her name is Elizabeth Peters on the book. That's her writer's name. And I think everybody loves those. So they're pretty good. The Elizabeth Peters books, there's 13 of them. I think, I think it's 13. And also Walteri's The Egyptian. Uh, Rainer, let's see. The subterranean chamber in the Great Pyramid. Does it make any sense to say that it is an unfinished chamber? It absolutely does. The Great Pyramid has three burial chambers, three. And they were intended in case the Pharaoh died before the pyramid was completed, you'd have a place to bury him. So the first one is underground. And that was in case the Pharaoh, Khufu, died within the first seven years or so. So Khufu, after seven years, is alive and well. You don't have to finish it. He's going to be OK. So we build another chamber higher up. Don't need that one even. He's alive after 20 years. So the third pyramid, the third room is where he's buried. So yes, it is an unfinished chamber. And the reason it's unfinished is Khufu really wanted to be buried inside the pyramid, and he was. I think I have time for a couple more. I'm looking yeah, at my Bob, I was going to just interject yeah. really quickly. If I could have you pick maybe two final questions that you want okay. to answer, um, sure, that would sure. be great. Sure, sure. Let me try. Um, let's try Kelisa. Um, a, professor, a professor of mine once referred to ancient Near Eastern objects with Egyptian influence as ancient Egyptomania. What are your thoughts on this? Where would a delineation be cross-cultural influences and Egyptomania? Ah, very nice, very nice. I think it's Egyptomania. I think the idea is that people are accepting the Egyptian influence on their objects because they love e Egypt. It's a positive to be Egyptian. You know, it's sort of dance like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian. They want to be like an Egyptian. So I think it's all Egyptian, Egyptomania. So I think we've got time for one more question. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, there's one here. The royal court sculptor, Tutmosis' tomb in Saqqara, has a unique wall painting showing a double occupant coffin with his wife. Is there any possibility that this was a real coffin created for that tomb? Interesting. It would be unique. I think it's possible, but we really don't know. So, Abby, I think that's our two questions. Is that it? That is it. Thank you so, so much, Bob. Um, this was really wonderful. I'm Abby Shu, the Deputy Director of External Relations and Advancement at The Speed. And we are so grateful to you for helping us to kick off our Global Speed season with our first ever virtual Global Speed. And a big thank you to your wife, Pat, who I know has been brilliant tech support behind the scenes as well. This was just absolutely incredible. We have Great questions continuing to pour in. We do have a recording of tonight's talk that we'll be happy to share with all of you who attended so that you can watch it afterwards. And I also wanna let you know about two other wonderful scholars who will be joining us to continue the Egypt Global Speed Lecture. And I hope that you all will all register for those talks. On February 16th, we have Salima Ikram who will be joining us. Um, she's a professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo. And then also on April 20th, we will have Kara Cooney, who's a professor, professor of Egyptian art and architecture at UCLA. So we look forward to two other great talks on Egypt. We hope you all will join us for both of those. And we also, um, for those of you who are in Louisville, we do have the Andy Warhol Revelation exhibition with us through November 29th. And we will be celebrating Warhol with a last hurrah at our next After Hours event on Friday, November 20th. We have a really great lineup planned. We have a 
Sister Ray, a Velvet Underground cover band. We also have a great talk that's um, going to be called Andy Warhol Fairness and Faith that we're hosting in collaboration with the Fairness Campaign. We're going to have State Representative Jim, Jim Wayne, and we're also going to have Mike O'Loughlin, who has a national podcast on Catholicism and the AIDS epidemic. So we're really interested in that. It should be a fun night, and I hope you all will plan to register and join us for that as well. A big thank you to Bob and a thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a great evening. Bye, guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs>